Activity 16 with the Nathan Carter Show from Dublin's Mansion House tomorrow night at 9.30. But now here on one, never short of a song or two, Luke Kelly, Prince of the City. Luke is he's one of my favourite singers of all time. There's people who own truth and he had it very much in his voice. You believe every word he, he screams. Luke actually was a bit of a genius, you know. He was as gentle as a lamb. He was a very genteel person. There was more to Luke Kelly than that, the eye. He had a special, special talent. And everybody knew him, of course. He was, he was like a Dublin hero. He was a prince of the city. Well, in the merry month of May, now from me home, I started, left the girls and two were nearly broken hearted, saluted father dear, kissed me darling mother, drank a pint of beer, me grief and tears, the smothered enough to reap the corn and leaf, for I was born, got a stout black sword, the banished ghost and goblets, a brand new pair of brogues to rock, the love of the bogs and frighten all the dogs on the rocky road. It's a double of one, two, three, four, five, one, two, Luke Kelly was born in Sheriff Street in Dublin in 1940. He was one of a close-knit family that included three brothers, two sisters and Luke's grandmother on his mother's side. Times were tough as money was tight and the family, like many at the time, made their own entertainment. We were one of the lucky families. There was quite a, a lot of hardship in that particular area. But our dad, Luke Sr., had a permanent job in Jacob's Biscuit Factory. So we weren't too badly off compared to maybe some of the other families. We had no radio or television in them days, as most people of, of that era wouldn't have had anyway. We'd kind of sit round, and he had this talent, our father, to sing Negro spirituals. Paul Robson stuff. And we used to just sit round and join in, and, and that was the entertainment we had in those days. Oh, Kamali tramps and the hawker lads and gay the rars of blood. People told stories when they didn't have radio and television through songs. And there were rallying songs, there were play songs. There were songs that, that, that people used for games, and children knew how to entertain themselves with these songs. But earlier than that, there were songs relating to the Fenians and the Invincibles, and uh, even 1913 and, and 1916. And people remembered uh, the heroes of the past. So there was still that tradition in, in the 40s and 50s. Uh, the other thing that happened in Dublin uh, that I think kept the tradition alive was the tradition of people after the pub, pub closure, the half dozen, and then they went home to the house. And in the houses, uh, people would sing songs. Everyone did our party piece. And some would play a bit of music if they had music and entertain themselves. So that was still a live tradition in, in the Dublin I grew up in. The Kelly family's home life was abruptly brought to a halt when a fire engulfed their home and they reluctantly relocated to the north side suburb of Whitehall on the outskirts of their beloved inner city. Our mam, who was born and reared in the North Wall area, she said, we're moving to the country. So um, I remember the first time we ventured, Luke and I had to make our way. We had to find where Whitehall was, really and truly. I think we had to get buses for the first time. And eventually we, we moved to Whitehall, lock, stock and barrel, and we moved into a three-bedroom semi-detached house, which is still there today. And he was never really comfortable with moving to Whitehall. And indeed, like a lot of the older people, used to come back into the city. And I remember people who went to Ballyfermot from the Liberties, they'd come in on the weekend to have a few points, meet their old friends, and try and keep in touch with that community. And Luke was no different. Life in Whitehall had some small compensations, however, one of which was the local weekend dance, the scene of Luke's very first public appearance. There was an assembly hall around the corner in Whitehall where we used to go dancing. A kind of a, a local hop on a Saturday, a Friday night or Saturday night, and they had a talent competition. The song Luke chose to sing was um, Pat Boone's Love Letters in the Sand. <laughs> they were the songs of the time. That was my first recognition of, of Luke singing songs, really and truly. From an early age, Luke was known for his restlessness, and by the late 1950s, at age 17, he left Dublin and travelled to the Isle of Man, before shortly thereafter moving to England. He went to Pig in England, that's what it was called. You were Irish and you stayed in Ireland, and you had your phone, you, and you had your 
pioneer pin. And, you know, the past is a foreign country. You know, they do things differently. It's absolutely incredibly accurate in this case. This was a, a, a deeply devout Catholic Ireland. He went to pagan England. In fact, when I got to pagan England about 1965, I thought it was fantastic. It was a great place altogether, you know, and everybody was just cool. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, you were expecting people to have all the mark of the devil on them, but they didn't. Still footloose and fancy free, Luke decided to try his luck working on the buildings in the city of Leeds in the north of England, where his elder brother Paddy was already hard at work. We got them fixed up in the digs, but then we had to get them fixed up with some work as well, which we did. He got a job on the site that we were working on. And uh, he became what we call a trainee steel fixer. A bit naive poor Luke was at that time. And somebody said to him, you see that job you're doing? He said, them fellas working on the third and fourth floor, they're getting a lot more money than you are. And he said, is that correct? So Luke, in his naivety, decided to do something about it. And he thought he'd go and see the, the site agent who was in charge of all the labour. So he went and saw the site agent out, right? Told him he demanded what he thought he was worth. The next thing he got a kick up the backside and he was sent down the road, sacked on the spot. And nearly got us sacked as well. Fare you well, my lovely Nancy, for it's now I must leave you. He went to, to stay with a family in Birmingham called Mulready's. And Sean Mulready had left this country under pressure from the clergy. He was seen to be a communist and a teacher, and it wasn't really popular in those days. And a lot of Irish emigrants had left, not just for economic circumstances, because they couldn't tolerate the, the um, I suppose, the repression of ideas that existed in the 40s and the 50s. The banning of books, the banning of artists, the social pressures on people. And through the Mulready's, he would have made contacts with other young people. There was grown, a growth in folk clubs in England in those days. And at that time, I remember there was a folk club called the Star Folk Club, run by the great Scottish balladeer called Ian Campbell. Never, I never even heard him talking about folk singing or anything. He was more into the Frank Sinatra, Perry Como stuff. But somehow or another, he took a shine to what he'd heard. Despite displaying no particular interest in folk music, Luke was a regular at various music clubs in Newcastle. Early in 1960, he came across a group of English folk singers who ironically were performing a song that was as Dublin as could be. I think it was the old triangle was the one that sparked them off. Listen, that was Brendan Bean's song um, from uh, Brendan Bean's play, The Queer Fella. Um, Luke heard that in, in, in a club in the north of England, in fact, and was amazed <laughs> how powerful it was, and that attracted him to go back and start researching his own background and his own traditions. That's where he got an education, and he would have met two types of people. He would have met the emigrant Irish who would have gone over on the cattle boat, and Luke would have been mixing with these people, he would have known these people, and they would have been maybe native Irish speakers who were trying to hold on to some sort of a sense of identity in Birmingham or Newcastle or wherever it was, or Luton or wherever, and also try and preserve a certain dignity as well, because, you know, no blacks, no dogs, no Irish, you know? So he was mixing with these people, and he would have been hearing, probably in the pubs, he was hearing their songs, Irish songs, traditional songs, that would have been brought over with them. And also, he, he came in touch with, through the folk clubs again, the songs of Hugh McCall, Peggy Seeger, and of course Ian Campbell. So he learned a repertoire over there. And that's the repertoire that we started to hear, here when he brought it back. With our nets and gear we're fed. Luke was now learning up to a dozen or so songs a week. And on his return to Dublin, his developing repertoire found a ready and willing audience as the ballad boom was beginning its meteoric rise. The ballad boom was a kind of a revival by young people of a new spirit of revolt in various ways. People going out, boys and girls were meeting each other, sat going to flag yards down the countryside, was unheard of and was frowned upon, in fact, in, in that young men and women were going together. And the, the, the upsurge was also linked with campaigns for human rights, civil rights, housing, which was kind of a wake-up from the dull and dark 50s. You had Luke coming back with these hugely expressive, passionate songs with a, with a, a burning message, 
which, you know, um, we, we, you know, Ireland had been listening to the Jimmy Shand and his Kayleigh band and, you know, Charlie Bourne and his gay guitar on, you know, Saturday afternoons on radio. And certainly you have Luke Kelly and he's given it large. In Alabama, 1958, the cost of human life is very low. You didn't need a big investment to be part of the folk tradition. You, you, you mightn't be great, but you could get yourself an old guitar or you could sing without a guitar and be part of it. I'd walk to work for the week to save enough petrol to get the house uh, for the Saturday night gig. And it was electrifying when Kelly hit, hit it. But he had the madness in him anyway, which, which lit a fire under us all, you know. The Clancy's were flying high in New York and um, Liam, got a lot of the, the songs off, off, off of Luke, like the Wild Rover and that type of thing, which became very hackneyed afterwards, but it was a great song at the time. By 1962, Luke was back home in his native city, where the Dubliners had established themselves as the leading folk group of the day. Within a year, they were signed to the premier international folk label of the time, Transatlantic Records. By now, Luke had married an Irish-American drama enthusiast, Deirdre O'Connell, who shared Luke's sense of artistic adventure. In 1964, the couple left Dublin to be with two of the leading exponents of folk music at the time, Peggy Seeger and Ewan McCall. I think part of the reason that I ended up in the group was because Luke left. You know, a typical Irish group will start with a split, you know. They were just getting, they were just getting established when, when Luke, restless spirit that he was, he, he had this hankering to go off and, and play around the folk clubs in England and expand his repertoire and so on. Everything changed there. The, whatever, whatever the influence they had, it, it made a big impression on them because I think they taught him songs or they gave him songs that we'd never heard before or nobody else had heard. Just a note for time is short, dear. Hard the work and long the day. You and McCall and Peggy Seeger were cultivating that idea of a, a vibrant working class culture. Sing out, I think was the term they used to use, that people should sing out their grievances, sing out their loves, their hates, and be inspired by their own ability to do that. And that was the tradition of Dublin. Luke attended uh, workshops that McCall gave, and uh, I think he was quite a hard taskmaster as, as a teacher of you know, how to perform and how to sing and how to get the most advantage out of your performance and so on. When he'd be home at weekends, he'd come out to Hote where we were playing in the, in the Royal Hotel. And it was during those occasions that I first heard him singing songs like Dirty Old Town, uh, School Days Over, Travelling People, all these wonderful songs. You know, he could just come up on the stage and say, listen, I've, I've just picked up a great song, Dirty Old Town, wait till you hear this. Irish history is, is, is littered with stories of people who went away and who found something and brought it home. And had they never gone away, it never would have made any sense. It's a, it's a, we're a fascinating country that way. He was a kind of a disciple of Ewan McCall. I think he saw McCall as a kind of a god and Luke was going around spreading the gospel according to McCall, you know. I mean, Luke saw his singing as part of the, uh, the rise of the underdog. And he gave an impetus in the city which was missing. And I think the rise of Luke and the Dubliners was very important to the development of the culture in Dublin. My girl by the factory wall. Dirty old town. Dirty old town. Oh, he's responsible for an awful lot, Ewan McCall is. Without him, you wouldn't have had the big folk revival in England, but then we wouldn't have had it here either because he directly influenced Luke. So we owe Ewan McCall a lot as well for keeping these songs alive that you just take for granted now, like, oh yeah, I know that one. You might not have known that one had they not kept it going. Without them, we wouldn't have had the Dubliners. The Dubliners had established themselves beyond the local folk fraternity and were by now a major mainstream attraction. And this success was soon to be replicated abroad. Let me continue with a song. It's called The Black Velvet Band. It's got a chorus, which you probably know. So, here's it. Well, in a neat little town, they call Belfast. Apprentice 
the trade of his vow. Many an hour, sweet happiness, have I spent in that hateful town. A sad misfortune came over me, which caused me to stray from the land. Far away from my friends and relations, betrayed by the black velvet band. Let's hear you sing now. Luke is he's one of my favourite singers of all time. I was brought up with the Dubliners. Ringing in my ears, fantastic stuff to be brought up with. So yeah, from from day one. Luke Kelly as a name, as a, an individual name, I first became conscious of when I found a cassette in Ballymun where I grew up. I found a cassette on the green and it said Luke Kelly on one side and Bob Marley on the other. And it was a collection of Dubliners songs on one side. And and I had just got me first Walkman. And this was like a gift from the heavens, listening to Bob, you know. Because in Ballymun, there was, there was Bob Dylan, Lou Kelly and Bob Marley. They were like the, they were considered kind of the great men. Lou Kelly somehow embodied the image of the Irishman who wasn't afraid. I would have been a schoolboy at that stage and it would have been around 19... 19- 64, and a friend of mine called John McNally in Navan played me a sister's record. It was the first time I ever heard the Dubliners. And at the time, the song just leaped out of the speakers. I, I just thought it was quite astonishing piece of work. Now, it was the Dubliners, but it was, it was Luke. It was Luke's performance. It, it had nothing to do with whatever had come before, the Waltons programme or Val Dunican or the Bachelors or any of that stuff. This was edgy, really edgy. When I first heard him, I think it was Glenn Hansard singing Scorn Not in His Simplicity, and it was just this incredible version. And I thought it was just Glenn doing his bit of it. And once I looked into it and heard Luke's version, it's, you know, that's where we kind of get that Irishness in singing from. You hear that little lilt of how someone sings on the street corner and that's, that's Luke Kelly, he's still there. With Luke and Ronnie Drew, the Dubliners had two distinct and immediately identifiable voices that could deliver their ever increasing repertoire of songs. And it was Ronnie who performed their initial international success with a song that became a surprise hit for the group. I think we were the first Irish group to get into the British charts. We learned Seven Drug Nights from Joseph O'Haney, Joe Heaney, the uh, Connemara traditional Shano singer. And we just thought this is a bit of a crack, you know, it's a funny bit of a ditty. Sure, we'll stick it on as a track on our LP with Major Minor when we joined up with Philip Solomons. Phil came in to, to listen to what we'd done in the studio one day and when he heard uh, Seven Drunken Nights straight away his ears pricked up and he said, Jeez, that's going to be your single. And we said, single? Seven Drunken Nights? Uh, it seemed the most unlikely song to, to become a single, to us anyway, but he had connections with Radio Caroline and it uh, played off the air there as a single. And uh, it got into the charts, you know, to, to all our amazement. The national broadcaster actually had banned Seven Drunken Nights. I mean, that was the, you forget, it was the swing in 60s and it was, you know, flower power and all the rest of that. But, you know, the Dubliner single was banned and bizarre. Up to then, we were just playing in small clubs and little folk clubs and that kind of thing. This was a totally new world we found ourselves in now. Within a short time, we were filling halls like the, the Royal Albert Hall in London. And Radio Caroline reached into Northern Europe as well, so we were getting invitations to play in Germany and Holland. And after a while, we were playing more around Europe than we were at home or in England, you know. Dubliners had shown that you could have folk music and jigs and reels and, you know, folk songs and ballads, and you could 
wind up, you know, playing the Albert Hall and playing on top of the Pops. So, I mean, that was always, you know, there was a, a bar there that that people, that Irish people could get across, you know, if, if it was anyway half decent. Luke was one of us, Ronnie was one of us, the Dubliners, they were us. But to see somebody who'd done well and hear them on interviews speaking so eloquently with a strong accent, to me, that was something to aspire to. And that's partly why I'm very proud to keep my accent. That's who I am, you know, it's just where I'm, it's where I'm from. And Luke and the Dubliners definitely gave Dublin a huge sense of pride back to, to, to just being yourself. Luke's commitment to his socialist beliefs and internationalist values found further expression when his wife Deirdre O'Connell opened the Experimental Focus Theatre in 1967. He had that other, you know, a few other strings to his, his artistic bow. You know, I mean, he'd with Deirdre, he'd 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 actually set up the Focus Theatre, which small bespoke theatre, but it cost money, and also uh, into that into the Ireland of the time, it brought international plays, American and European plays, which you know give people an opportunity to see them, and of course her Stanislavski method, you know, informed a lot of the. Uh, acting community who went on to do great stuff. I still meet some of her former students, um, Tom Hickey, for example, and, and Sabina Higgins, her president's wife. She's, she's also a great actress and one of uh, Deirdre's former pupils. But uh, whenever there was funds needed for the building, I don't think there was any great arts grants in those days or any great official recognition of what the likes of Deirdre was doing. And the Dubliners would be rounded up by Lou. Come on, lads, we have to get a few bob for Deirdre and the Focus. We'll put on a few gigs and, and we often raise funds for, for them when they were needed like that, you know. By 1969, the Dubliners were broadening their musical horizons and the management drafted in a young and successful writer-producer to work on a new album. Phil Coulter at that time, let's not forget, was doing things like the Bay City Rollers, if not the Bray City Rollers, and he was... Um, you know, he was doing a lot of, I suppose what would be seen as fluff, but he was a very gifted man. And I remember how excited he was to be working with the Dubliners. These were serious people. Writing puppet on a string or congratulations, that's, that's one set of skills. Writing a song like Scorn Not His Simplicity, you still need the same skills, but you're calling on something completely different, which is in there. And what you're doing is you're kind of opening up you're, you're, you're peeling back layers of yourself, of, of your own emotions and of your own kind of personal history, and you're letting people in. Now, that didn't come easy for me. Uh, and if I hadn't had Kelly there continually pushing me, maybe I would never have done it. But um, when my first son was born with Down syndrome, um, it was kind of, I suppose, some sort of therapy for me to write a song about it. It took, I mean, it took a few months before I could even confront the whole the whole event and the whole experience. Um, but I remember really well when uh, when I played the song to Kelly. And I could just tell by the look in his eye that, and the kind of smile that, that he knew he'd gotten through to me and that I'd made that step. How she cried, tears of happiness day the doctor told her it's a boy. Scorn Not His Simplicity is a song my mother adored and when we were kids we heard it a lot. Put that voice against that song and the song is amazing. You know, put someone else's voice against that song and it's probably not going to work as well. I think it's an amazing song. Only he knows how to face the future Hopefully surrounded by despair That song is amazing. I mean, you, you can only write that through your own experiences and that's a heartbreaking song and a beautiful song um, and a gorgeous tribute from a father to a son. Um, but Luke delivered it. For not his simplicity But rather try to love him all the more That's soul. That's heart and soul in that song. Unbelievable. I challenge you to watch that performance and listen to that and not have a lump in your throat. 
and I know he didn't perform it often, and so it almost makes you know when you when you watch that piece of footage, it makes it all the more magic, you know. It's a moment in time and it's emotion. To me, that's one of my perf favorite performances of any song by anybody ever. That's that's definitely my top five. He was an astonishing stylist, and Luke, in a way, as a stylist, he was an interpreter, and. I know for a fact he actually chose his songs very carefully as well. He didn't have a huge, extensive repertoire of any old twaddle. They were handpicked for a reason, and they were his reasons. There were songs that he felt that he could work with and that he could get something out of, or that there was something in that he wanted to share. I met my love by the gasworks I want to be like Luke. Luke was able to sing with that working class Dublin accent, strong, and sound phenomenal. And that was very important for me as a kid, as a Dublin kid, because there was nobody else that I can remember that sang like that, that I could relate to. He had a habit sometimes of taking risks with a song, you know, he'd stretch a note a little bit beyond where it was written and uh, leave you a little bit worried he created a certain tension between himself and the listener and left you a little bit worried that he wasn't going to make it in time into the next line, but by some magical <laughs> gift that he had, he always, he, always, uh, he always just did exactly that. He put his hallmark, I think, on everything that he recorded, you know, every, every song that he recorded somehow became the definitive version for other people to learn from, you know, and they look to Luke in that respect. There's not many baritones and kind of hot, low tenors that make it as big voices, but he really had that huge voice that could just project from the back of the room and fill the space. In my memory, I will always see the town that I when I was writing The Town I Love So Well, there was only one voice that was in my, my mind as I was writing. And the evolution of The Town I Love So Well is quite interesting because it didn't come out of the blue. I was in Derry on the weekend that internment was introduced. So at first hand, I experienced those shock waves, And it was that sense of your place being violated. And it was very traumatic and it left a lot of angry people including me and so as a knee-jerk reaction to all of that I wrote an anti internment song and the very fact that it was an anti anything will tell you that you know it didn't have great roots didn't have substance it was as I said knee-jerk reaction it was off the time and this was a song called free the people but Kelly was all over it like a rash as soon as he heard it and we would recorded it within days and released it. Now, it wasn't a great song. I'm the first one to admit that Free the People is not a great song. But it got me into that kind of space of, of, of writing about what was going on in the North um, and addressing political issues, which I'd never done before and may never have done had it not been for Luke Kelly. I owe a great debt to Luke Kelly. Those would be probably two of my own favourite songs, Scarlet, His Simplicity, and uh, The Town Love So Well. It's well possible, well possible, that without Luke Kelly, they may never have existed. For what's done is done, and what's won is won, and what's lost is lost and gone forever. He was able to give voice to previous generations, you know, maybe in some case, centuries of ghosts, and, and bring some modern, you know, establish a modern connection with something that was very old. 
The Kelly Coulter relationship was further developed in 1973 when producer and one time Dubliners manager Noel Pearson staged the rock opera Jesus Christ Superstar in Dublin's Gaiety Theatre. It was a groundbreaking enterprise. It was such a ballsy production, that whole thing of putting up all these people that had never been on the theatre stage as such, like, and for, for, for Pearson to, to, to do it it, it, it took a lot of balls, you know, and it worked. I said, Jesus Christ, Mike Murphy must have taught him how to dance. <laughs> it took him a four left feet, you know. It was great. But, but, but thank Jesus, then he sang. So then all, all was forgiven, <laughs> you know. Prove to me that you're divine. Luke's flirtation with musical theatre didn't last. Ever restless, he came across a song that would forever be associated with him and the song's writer, Patrick Kavanagh. As Luke explained in a television programme, The Humours of Donnybrook, to the programme's host, Kieran McMahuna, and another guest, writer Benedict Kiley, in 1979. You remember yourself meeting the Mr Kavanagh? Yeah, on, on the one occasion that I, that I dared actually to speak to the man. But... Um, we were in a pub, we won't name the pub, I don't suppose it's allowed no, on the television. Name. Well, it was in the Bailey, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and he was singing in his own peculiar manner, and so was I, in my own peculiar manner. And he said, I've got a song for you. <laughs> and he said, you should sing Raglan Road. And I'm, I'm very proud of the fact that I got the imprimatur, as it were, from the man. And you did sing it, himself. and you will now. Well, I'd like to sing it now, yeah, yeah. why not? Luke Kelly oh, with okay. Alan O'Donnell. On Raglan Road Of an autumn day I saw her first and you And you know, the thing about Kavanaugh, you know, you wouldn't imagine him to be an A&R man, you know, and sort of thinking, I've got a song for him, like sort of Louis Walsh, you know, I think. I think maybe we can get somebody to sing this song. He wasn't, he didn't give it to anybody else. And there was, at that stage, there would have been plenty of old ballad singers around the place. He gave it to Luke Kelly. And Paddy Calvin, although he came from Monaghan, he captured the spirit of Dublin probably better than any poet of his time. Uh, I believe that the Rag Raglan Road fired the imagination of Luke when he heard it. And Paddy wanted him to sing that song. So there was no argument about copyright. It was just, why don't you sing my song, Luke? That was Paddy Cavan, and it was absolutely delighted when Luke recorded it. Yeah, I remember coming on the TV and my grandmother and my ma grabbing all of us and going, right, watch this, and the whole family just silenced. Its integrity was just dripping off the screen. And when you've got that as a kid, as a kind of, your ma going, well, there's the, you know, not that she ever says that, but there's the bar, you know. If you're gonna do music, you know, here's our, here's our guy, you know. You want to be his girl when he's singing that, you know, it's just... Um, I gave her gifts of the mind, I gave her secret signs. I mean... Thank you. Please let that be me, Luke. <laughs> it's been sung an awful lot of time in my company, but at the right time, and Luke Kelly singing it, it is absolutely haunting, and it is the very essence of what a singer is supposed to bring to a song. He explored that song, he brought everything out of it and brings you right into that lyric. Terrific. And Luke's independence of spirit, natural curiosity and signature delivery has ensured a legacy that has survived well after his own lifetime. You can hear Luke in modern Irish singer-songwriters now, 100%. And Damien Dempsey been at the fore of them for me. Um, and I'm sure you wouldn't mind that. That's a, that's a compliment. Um, Glenn Hansard, Paddy Casey, and um, all of the, the, the guys and the girls too. I'm one of them. Ah, hungry feeling. Hey, more me stealing, and the mice were squealing in my prison cell, and, and the, the old triangle, triangle. where 
and jingles, jangles all along the banks of the Royal Canal. It's been a great experience for me playing with, with this new generation of singers who have have taken up the gospel according to Luke. And uh, and yet, you know, it, it's nice the fact they don't they don't try to they don't try to imitate every nuance that Luke made that they, they make the song their own as well, they have their own interpretation, but but influenced greatly I think by, by Luke's Luke's singing. To begin the morning the screw was bawling. Get up ya bowsy and clean up yourself and the old triangle when jingle jangle all along the banks of the royal canal he was an absolute joy to be with, you know, and but he he also loved being a rock star. And I, he loved women. He liked I don't think he was so much uh you know, was he happy to be rich? I don't know if he was rich, but he was happy to have enough walking around money to be comfortable and for people to be glad to see him because he was quite famous. He really was enjoying life in a way that uh you know, was far from the agonised sort of suffering socialist that some people might have seen him as. And everybody knew him, of course. He was, he was like a Dublin hero, as, as was Ronnie and, and Barney, I think, maybe as well. I, I had a slightly lower profile, I think, myself, but I was, I was happy enough with that, you know. You just look at his hair. He was on fire with passion, that man was, and he got that across. And some people can be very good performers, but not necessarily charismatic. You can't learn that. You don't lick that off the ground. That's just, you, you have that or you, or you don't. And he had it. His recognition all the time uh, 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 overpowered him sometimes, you know. But because uh, he was instantly recognisable with the, with, the, with the mad red head and the whole nine yards. The sun is burned. By the late 1970s, after many years touring and recording, Luke was beginning to experience ill health. Alcohol was everywhere the Dubliners were. It was expected. And most of those wanting to meet the Dubliners thought that the quickest way to their heart was to buy them drink. Was he an alcoholic? I don't know. An alcoholic is somebody, I would assume, is who physiologically needs drink or they can't function. Now, I never felt that about Luke. He was much more interested in whatever book he was reading, whatever film he had seen, whatever conversation he had had. Uh, yeah, I didn't, he certainly was not obsessed by drink. You're on the road, you live, you, live, you live out of a suitcase and you never really had any home life. And I love kids and I didn't have any, which was kind of a tragedy really, I think. I was, look at a very gruff exterior, but it was a facade. He was as gentle as a lamb. He was a very genteel person, really. Yeah, he, 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 he's a barking dog, but he'd never bite, you know. Children tend to be a, an anchor in a family, I suppose. And uh, I think the fact he didn't have any children himself, he didn't have that, that, that anchor. But he was generally a, a restless spirit anyway. I think he missed children himself because he was very good with kids, you know. When my own kids would be around, he'd, he'd have them up in his lap, talk to them. He had this fatherly kind of uh, aura about him, I think. We better get back to reality now, to folk songs. This one is from Scotland. I learned from a, a friend of mine over there. Beautiful In 1983, song. just three months before he died, Luke appeared with the Dubliners on RTE's The Music Show. It was to be his final television performance. I must away now I can no longer tarry. Middle 70s going into the 80s. I think things started to go a little bit wrong for Luke in as much as his health started to deteriorate. I remember we went to a club in Birmingham. I looked around after a while and he was fast asleep. Just fell asleep. And when it was time to go, I had to give him, come on, Luke. So. And 
he said, well, I don't feel that good. Uh, I think that was when the headaches were, were beginning to play. Uh, what could you say? They, they were starting to hurt. And um, I think that was the start of, of, of well, he was diagnosed with, with brain tumours uh, eventually. A lot of the time, well, Luke was forgetful and that, and, and John and I often discussed this. And we used to think it was a gargle, you know, but sure, it was actually the 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 the, the, the tumor was was growing, and and um, his forgetfulness became more frequent. And he didn't like anybody talking about it. I think, I think he he had a few words with our Jim. Jim mentioned something about his health, and I don't think he was too happy about it. But uh, maybe that was Luke. Luke wouldn't want. Anybody making a big fuss? I was in Cork, I was singing in West Cork the night he collapsed on the stage in the Opera House in Cork. Then we were in Cork with him while well, he was hospitalised there. And fair play, the man that got him that time saved his life. We went to see him the next day and he was sitting up in the bed after the operations. It's right, it's right. What's all the fuss about was his attitude, you know. But unfortunately, the, the tumour was deep-seated and, and after another couple of operations, there was nothing more they could do. It, it, it kept uh, growing again. We all knew that the, this was very serious. Um, indeed, I met him a few times after that when he was around and very quiet. He became very reserved and very quiet. When you think of Luke singing, it was the power of his voice uh, without a microphone that, and, and he would throw that voice and there was such strength and such dynamism about it. Uh, that you knew immediately when you met him that that was gone. He was devoid of self-pity, absolute no self-pity, no down. I think he considered it a nuisance and a limiting factor in his life. It really was limiting his life, and for that it was a nuisance. But there was no self-pity, no complaining, none at all. Just that's the way the cards are dealt, and, and you play with the cards you have in your hand. When he was checking into hospital for the last time, he had to fill up the usual registration form. And when it came to re religion, what religion are you? Formerly, he might have said, I'm a communist or an atheist, but this time he said, RC. <laughs> so maybe, maybe that was one of the signs of resignation, you know. He's the only person I ever saw on a life support machine. And I remember going home to my wife and kids and I was crying. I said, if anything ever happens to me, don't ever, ever put me on that thing, ever. Just let me go. And I, I, I was, it was the worst thing I've ever seen in my life. Uh, to see him with such a strong body character in this total state of... of, of it was awful. I, I can't even describe it. And uh, um, we, went through, we went through the mill there when, when he was on that for a while. And uh, thankfully, I wasn't there the night they pulled the plug. And... Uh, I was very glad I wasn't. A minstrel boy, you charm your way through life, enriching all who chance to pass your way. You shelter wayward spirits from the night and raise them up on wings at dawn of day. Though links with us, alas, too soon are severed, your spirit and your song will live forever. Whitehall Church, Unbelievable. It was like, well, the, the people, the church wasn't, they couldn't hold all the people that, 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 that were there. It was national mourning almost, you know, the, the, the church out on the north side was chock-a-block. I remember having a rise smile to myself, there was like seven priests on the altar, including my own brother, Father Joe. Um, and I thought Kelly would have had a good smile at this. Now seven priests come celebrating his funeral mass <laughs> because he was many things, look, but gospel greedy would not have been one of them. But we all had a sense that he was gone too soon. That voice was silenced and there's never been one like it. There was a real um, a sense of a national loss, I think, that somebody very, very important had, had left us. And Luke had contributed so much in his short years up to his death. Uh, that I think people felt there was so much more to be given there, you know, so much more for Luke to give. And uh, that in itself was a, a second sense of loss, I suppose, you know, but we'd, we'd never, Luke hadn't realised his full potential and we'd never hear all these other wonderful things that he might have done. His death was 
the death of a major figure in this city, you know, and not just a great Irish figure, a Dublin figure, you know. He just resonated of Dublin walking around this city. He was just, he, he was a prince of the city. Ed Sheeran rang me one afternoon and he was in Christy Moore's house and he said, how are you, Glenn? Uh, this is Ed Sheeran. Uh, I'm just ringing, asking if you're around tomorrow night. Or actually it was tonight. He was doing it that, that, he rang me that afternoon, the afternoon of the first gig. Would I sing Molly Malone with him? And I said, I said, man, well, first of all, hello, good to meet you. I said, do you happen to know the old triangle? He had the female prison verse, and a couple of the lads from Codaline had a couple of other verses, and Jason, Jason had a verse, and as we went on, and my God, just to hear the response that the Old Triangle got with 80,000 essentially, you know, young, young, young people, uh, they knew every word, like, well, they knew, certainly knew the chorus. It was an incredible moment. It just felt so right. It was it was just like being in a little in a little pub, even though you're in this massive stadium with everybody. But it, it was such a, a unifying moment. It just it felt great. It just puts it in a time and place, which is what Luke did with so many songs. He kind of made them of his moments, and I think that was the difference with his renditions of songs. You know, it, from then on, we're always singing Luke's version. They tore the place down and it felt great. It just felt great to be in that particular place, you know, not far from where, from where you know, Luke lived or Brendan being and just to, to feel that sense of, uh, of, of pulling a song out of the past and pulling it right into the now because he had been playing his own, you know, number ones like all evening, like these songs that are super popular and to end his gig on a Dubliner song was, was, his, was him seriously doffing that, the hat to, uh, you know, to our town, you know, and Luke. I think Luke inspired ordinary people in the field that they were important. He encouraged them to sing out about love, hate, or the things that concerned them. And he taught them how to enjoy themselves and not to be suppressed by their betters and to have a sense of internationalism as well as a strong sense of national identity. All of those characteristics are there, but also to respect the traditions of the past and to carry them with us into the future. On Raglan Road of an autumn day I saw her first and knew that her dark hair would weave us that I might one day rule I saw the danger and I passed Along the enchanted way And I said, let grief we have fallen leaf at the dawning of the day. I think about him all the time. I, I, I often think what he'd be like at his age now. He would be 75. I'd love to see what Lou Kelly would be like at 75. He was a special guy. He had a special, special talent. Oh, I think of them. I think of them all. I think of them all ne nearly every day, you know. O often uh, with, with comical effect, you know, some of the funny things that happened on the road. Yeah, you'd imagine we might talk about Luke and how great he was and reminisce, but somehow I think he's so present in all our minds that we don't need to do that, you know. His, his spirit is still there. 
You go into a pub in Ireland and you'll see somebody throw their head back and sing with all their heart and their soul. Um, and you feel so proud. And he did that um, very much and on an international scale. So people could get us. This is us, this is our passion, these are our songs, this is our history. And I'm very proud that he was a dub. For a songwriter, there's no greater treat, no greater pleasure, no greater privilege than to have somebody like Luke Kelly breathe life into your song. There's a line in The Great Hunger, um, Clavin's line, and he says, unless the clay is in the mouth, the singer's singing is useless. Fantastic. And he obviously, he understood clearly that the clay was in Luke's voice, that, that he was of the people. It's for the confirmation, if you like, of the fact that, that Luke actually was a bit of a genius, you know. I dreamed I saw Joe Hill last night, alive as you and me. And what he was really gifted with was, was a voice that just pushed all of the nonsense out of the way and walked right through the centre of the room and walked right to the centre of your heart and you couldn't but surrender to it. There's, there's, there's people who own truth and he had it very much in his voice. It's unmistakable. The minute he opens his mouth, you don't have to say, who's that? You, you know who it is. You know? And that, that, was his, that, was his, that was his magic. Says Joe, I never die. The copper bosses, they shot you, Joe. They filled you full of lead. Take more. Jackie Hurley put some of Ireland's top sports stars through their paces on New Year's Eve at 6.30 as we look back at the sporting highlights of 2015. Coming up after the break, Agnes is determined to make this year a happy one in Mrs. Brown's Boys. Next. Standing there as big as life.